guys didn't we? Yep. Friday, the 19th of May, 2000. We're presenting our second seminar in a month on World War II, featuring veterans of that conflict. And we're trying to combine and still in our young people a knowledge of what the older generation went through. Because they're not going to be around too much longer. And you need to know what you need to know basically what they did for our country, what their friends did for our country, the ones that didn't come back. I want you to keep in mind Memorial Day is coming up. And for these gentlemen, that's the most sacred uh, national holiday that we have. Because we remember the sacrifices that their friends went through, the ones who didn't make it back. Or the ones who uh, did serve and are no longer with us. Okay, so today we're going to feature the War in the Pacific. And I made up some notes. I also made up a little slideshow. And I'll be showing slides of uh, 15 of them as I read through this text. So you can uh, focus on the screen, or you can follow along as I read my notes. Okay, by the late 1930s, the Japanese Empire had extended its control throughout Southeast Asia and was looking for more resources to fuel its ambition in dominating this part of the world. This map shows the extent of Japanese control. <coughs> 1941. On December 7, 1941, the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor plunged the United States into a war that was probably inevitable. The United States declared war on December 8, the same day the Japanese struck U.S. bases in the Philippines, Wake Island, and Guam. <coughs> With devastating effect and also began attacks on Thailand, Malaysia, and Hong Kong. On the 9th of December, two days after Pearl Harbor, the Japanese invaded the Gilbert Islands. The United States was up against a formidable adversary. Within six months, the Philippines had fallen. During the Bataan Death March, 76,000 exhausted Americans and Filipinos were forced to march 65 miles to their prison camps. Many stragglers were clubbed, shot, stabbed, bayoneted, or beheaded, and left where they led. In June 1942, the Japanese sent a strike force of over 150 vessels to attack the United States base in the Midway Islands. The plan was to lure the remnants of the U.S. fleet at Pearl Harbor out and annihilate it once and for all. This shows an American plane having just bombed a Japanese aircraft carrier. It was not to be. Navy cryptologists had broken the operational code of the Imperial fleet and the Japanese trap backfired. Admiral Yamamoto's fleet limped back to Japan short, four aircraft carriers, 322 planes, and 3,500 men. The American retreat was over. Now much of the fighting would be done by crack divisions of combat marines. And I might interject that we have six combat marines here today. And the early conquests of the Japanese would be rolled back slowly, one by one. <coughs> the first U.S. targets were the Japanese-held Solomon Islands. Solomon Islands, right down to this vicinity. From here, enemy bombers at Guadalcanal would be able to strike in American positions. It had to be taken, and both sides knew it. On August 7, 1942, the attack began. Guadalcanal and its airstrip, Henderson Field, would not be secured until the 9th of February, six months later. Henderson Field, there's the base, excuse me, the uh, airstrip that the American forces had to capture. 1,769 Americans fell to enemy fire. Over 25,600 Japanese were killed at this battle. Special mobile marine combat units, 1st Raider Battalion, helped turn the tide at Guadalcanal and the Solomon Islands. 24 men fought with such valor that they actually had 
U.S. Navy ships named after them. And this first Marine Raider Battalion was called Edson's Rangers for their commander. We have two Raiders, survivors of Guadalcanal, here with us today. In November 1943, the United States Marines began a costly assault in the Gilbert Islands at Akin and Tarawa. Two miles long and 900 yards wide, Betio Airstrip was the main target. Ten tons of high explosives per acre. This is the island. They call it a two by four island. It wasn't even two by four. Two miles by 900 yards. <coughs> Betio Airstrip was the main target. There's a strip. Ten tons of high explosives per acre were landed that morning by Navy guns before the storming of the island began. And this is after heavy bombing by B-24 Liberators. Unfortunately, the enemy was so well dug in and fortified that artillery fire had little effect and ground troops took heavy losses. <coughs> On November 24, 17 Japanese survivors surrendered. 4,700 of the enemy were killed and 1,027 Marines and 29 naval officers and men had lost their lives. A painful lesson was learned regarding Japanese fortifications and their willingness to fight to the death. In January 1944, the U.S. landings in the Admiralty and the Marshall Islands began. In June, the Mariana Islands were struck as they contained key air, air bases at Saipan, Tinian, and Guam. Back to our map. Saipan and Guam. Tinian's in this neighborhood, too. 1,300 miles from Tokyo, they would be well within range of the new B-29 bombers headed for targets in Japan. The problem was having enough fuel to get back. 20,000 Marines followed by reserves of Marine battalions and an Army division took three weeks to secure the islands. This is uh, just Saipan, by the way, at a cost of 16,525 American <coughs> casualties. That's killed and wounded. 29,000 Japanese defenders were killed with almost no prisoners being taken. To compound, compound the horror, hundreds of civilians committed suicide by wading into the sea or jumping off cliffs, fearful of U.S. soldiers for captivity. At Guam, 100 miles to the south, the assault began on the 21st of July, 1944. Although the island was officially under control after five days, the Japanese refused to recognize the inevitable, and it would be another two weeks before it was declared secure. Some small bands of Japanese held out the hills for years after the battle, not even realizing that the war had ended. On September 15th, the 1st Marine Division and Army troops began the attack on Peleliu after three days of heavy bombardment. Peleliu posted a major Japanese airfield that was deemed a major threat to any U.S. advance in the Philippines. It's Peleliu right here. Philippines, we had to liberate. Stepping stones toward Japan. The island was heavily defended by Imperial troops dug into a network of pillboxes and 500 coral caverns and caves. The Japanese would now remain hidden in one overrun, pop up, and shoot Americans from the rear. The conquest of this island and airstrip, airstrip took over a month and killed over 1,500 Americans. This is a painting by a time, excuse me, a life artist who was actually on the scene. Hell of a jungle fire. <coughs> Japanese dead number, numbered over 10,000. By October 1944, the Supreme Allied Commander, General Douglas MacArthur, had returned to the Philippines and a campaign to liberate it from Japanese control began. MacArthur, he made sure that doctors were there that day to show him returning to the Philippines. The battles here would last until June 30th, 1945. The next two stepping stones were Iwo Jima and Okinawa. Iwo Jima was an eight square mile island of volcanic rock and lied 660 miles southeast of Tokyo. It could serve as a refueling stop for the B-29 and B-24s that would soon be flying out of the fields in the Marietta Islands to bomb the Japanese mainland. This is from an, a, uh, an intelligence reconnaissance photograph. 
In late 1944, the aerial bombardment of Iwo Jima began and continued for a record 74 straight days. <coughs> 21 Japanese defenders survived. Excuse me, 21,000 Japanese defenders survived this, with scores of underground fortresses connected by 60 miles of tunnels stocked with food, water, and ammunition. The surface was covered with concrete pillboxes and blockhouses housing some 800 gun positions. On February 19, 1945, the attack began as the landing ships dropped the Marines on loose volcanic sand, and it was nearly impossible to get traction in it. Only a third of Iwo Jima had been taken when the United States flag appeared over the peak of Mount Suribachi on D-Day Plus Four, and this photograph, which I know you've all seen before, is snapped. 27 Congressional Medals of Honor were awarded for individual acts of heroism under fire at Iwo Jima, almost all of them to U.S. Marines. The island was deemed secure on March 25th, 25 days longer than the planets had counted on. 6,821 Americans and 19,000 Japanese died at Iwo Jima, 8 square miles. Six days later, on Easter Sunday, the invasion of Okinawa began. Okinawa had well over 100,000 Japanese defenders. It was the last stand, a mere 330 miles from Tokyo, and was big enough to support 800 heavy bombers. The Japanese defensive lines were tougher than those at Tarara and Iwo. Organized resistance gradually fell apart by June 22, 1945. 11,000 Japanese defenders were dead, with over 10,000 taken prisoner. For the Americans, victory had a price. Seven 7,613 killed or missing in action, with over 55,000 other casualties. And one of our veterans here today lost his eyesight 55 years ago at Okinawa. In July 1945, the Potsdam Conference in defeated Germany, President Truman warned the Japanese of surrender. On August 6, 1945, a single bomb tumbled from a B-29 superfortress flying from Tinian Island in the Marianas. Hiroshima was devastated by the blast, thermal, and radioactive effects that would lead later estimators to put the death toll at close to 140,000 Japanese. 26. With no call, call, excuse me, with no answer to the call for surrender coming from the Japanese High Command, on August 9th, the second and last bomb was deployed against Nagasaki in southeastern Japan. The death toll here was at least 70,000. That evening, the Japanese Emperor Hirohito spoke to his people and said, the time has come when we must bear the unbearable. It was the first time they had ever heard his voice. On September 2nd, 1945, the Japanese delegation signed the terms of surrender aboard the USS Missouri in Tokyo Bay. In Europe and the United States, it was exactly six years to the day that the bloodiest conflict in human history had begun. It is my earnest hope, said MacArthur, indeed the hope of all mankind, that from this solemn occasion, a better world shall emerge from the blood and carnage of the past. World War II had ended. Today we have uh, six distinguished gentlemen who are there. Bob Adams, <coughs> Jerry West, Art Laporte, Daniel Lawler, Walt Hammer and James Butter. And <coughs> my first two uh, presenters were members of Etsy's Raiders in Guadalcanal. And uh, this is a photograph of a mortar gun crew, I believe, from Mr. Addison. And uh, Mr. Addison is uh, one of the gentlemen in the photograph. Which one were you, Bob? On the right. That one? Stealing on the right. What was your job? I was just a gunner. I dropped the shell. You dropped the shell in it. And then what? Branch? We were. No. <laughs> <laughs> the 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 Can you guys tell us a little bit about what happened? Yeah, well, yeah. Well, what happened? A, few things. Well, a couple other groups, and Jerry always went first, so I think I'll go first today. Everybody can hear me? All right. I used to this because I retired as that teacher up at, uh, up, at, uh, up at the ACC. Everybody hear me back there, all right? Uh, 
I'm, I'm more comfortable with it. Well, uh, 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 Mr. Roselle left off one important item, one important event. On December 7, 1941, was my 19th birthday. And uh, so I had a personal grudge in this. And uh, a month later, I was in the Marine Corps, and seven months later, we were in combat. And uh, now, a little background, he, he told you of the, the sea battles of Midway, and, uh, and there was one down in Coral Sea. And they, they kind of put a finger on the Jap fleet. And uh, the Japs also had their eyes on Samoa, Fiji Islands, New Caledonia, New Zealand, Australia. And with that airstrip on Guadalcanal, that's where they could, their bombers could reach those areas. And uh, so now uh, this uh, whole first division, we have a couple other fellows here in the first division, but they came later and, and, uh, when the first division went other places. And uh, the first division was down in Australia and had been there only a couple of weeks. And uh, they, they were in any, any kind of shape into combat. Fortunately, our fellows had been in Samoa for a couple of months from training, so our fellows were in pretty good shape. This one battalion had some traders. And, uh, but when they found out that the Japs were building this, now I, I'm going to explain something else now too. When I'm referring to our enemy, that they're Japs. I, nowadays, I refer to them as the Japanese people. But to us, I think all the guys, they were Japs. And uh, anyway, when we found out they were building that airstrip, we had to get that thing back. And uh, so the this first division was called on. And uh, now, they were very, they had very few, there were very little trouble taking the island and uh, or the airstrip on Guadalcanal. There were very few uh, enemy uh, soldiers there. Mostly, they were Korean workers who were working on it. So the first day they had the airstrip and a perimeter defense around it. And that's all of Guadalcanal we had, was a perimeter defense around that airstrip. And then they could land on that island. Uh, you know, all we had was just a little, little a perimeter right around here, that's all. They could land on the island, all of they did too. But our battalion was given the task of taking the island of Tulagi, which is across Sealark Channel. And it was only a little island about a half mile wide, three miles long. This is where Japanese troops were. Before the war, this was the uh, governor's uh, <coughs> residence uh, for the governor of the British Solomon Islands. And it was a beautiful little island, great ground, pretty field, and uh, big, almost mansions there. And this is where the Japanese were uh, at, and they were so it took us quite a while, I don't know, before well, the first day, we had them in what we thought was a pocket that we couldn't even use mortars. So, well, but unbeknownst to us, we had bypassed a lot of them, which were in caves. And then at night they came out, and then we all hell for the police at night. And, uh, and so it took us a while to dig them out. Very few of them would surrender. A lot of them just left in the caves, and all blocked them up, and, uh, because they just wouldn't come out. And so it took us several other more days to secure that island. We stayed there a couple more weeks. Then we went over to Guadalcanal. Now in the meantime, there was another big sea battle, the Battle of Savo Island, which we watched August 9th. We watched it from Tulagi. We said, oh boy, there goes another jet ship. There goes another one. Oh. We lost four cruisers that night. And uh, then the next by the time we got up in the morning, not in the morning, by the time daybreak came, our fleet had gone back south with all our supplies and everything, and we were left there. All they did was leave a few of our <coughs> ships that we traveled on, the APDs, old World War I destroyers that were converted into to carry a company of troops. They were left behind. And there what, what took us over in Guadalcanal. <coughs> Gary and I happened to be on the same ship, the USS Paul Moon, this was, uh, people asked me, would you have any close calls? Or, well, <coughs> you know, a few here and there, but you know, but this was one that we definitely remember because they, we was there, oh, what, four or five o'clock in the afternoon when, when, uh, when we got over towards the Canal, and they were debating whether to let stay ship, board ship overnight or take us ashore. So they decided to take us ashore. We had no sooner stepped on the Canal and the ship was gone. Jack came over and bombed it in three minutes it was down. So that was one of the first, you know, one, one for a close call that we could remember. And, uh, so
resolved. Then there had been one battle on the, on the canal before we got over there, the Battle of Tenerife. A thousand Japs thought they could take the airstrip back, and they tried it. The Marines sucked them in. And I think they killed all the 20 or 30 of them. Their Colonel committed Harry Perry. So they would have waited until. But in the meantime, we went over, and we got in there deep in the defense around the water canal, around Wonder Ridge. And they knew the Japs were, had been landing particularly at a place down the beach about 20 miles called Tassimboko, in the village, and uh, the Japs pushed out all the uh, uh, natives, they were up in the hill. So we went down to a raid down there, and they said, oh, there's probably only about one gun for every 10 Japs. But they didn't tell us it was a 75 officer. <laughs> but anyway, most of the, the, those Japs had pushed off into the jungles, and uh, there was just a rear echelon there. And uh, we didn't have too much trouble. We lost two men, and uh, we captured the, the, uh, the uh, artillery pieces, which they would have used on us later, and uh, pulled them out in the ocean, blew up an ammunition dump, destroyed all the food that we could not carry in our pockets. And uh, then we went back and got in our perimeter defense. And uh, a couple of days later, 3,500 of them attacked 700 of us on what was then called Wonder Ridge, is now called Edson's Ridge, but everybody refers to it as the Bloody Ridge. And uh, I think they left, after a couple of days, they left over 1,400 of them. There's a picture in the book right there by Dan, uh, right here, Dan, this book right here. That picture right there, there's uh, some of the Japs that were left behind. And, uh, so that, then, uh, we, and then we participated in a couple more battles. Well, if they'd have gotten through us, they'd have had the airstrip back. And so, through uh, our efforts with some of the paratroopers that were with us, uh, we saved Henderson Airfield. And that was the turning point in the whole battle of Guadalcanal, and of course, Guadalcanal was the whole turning point of the Pacific War. And we had a couple, engaged in a couple more battles uh, up at the Botanical. And uh, finally, in October, Thirteen. Uh, we had an even swap. Three thousand army came in. And our our battalion that had about nine hundred, and there were about three hundred of us left. So three thousand army came in and relieved three hundred of us. So we kind of even swap. And, but we took it. And so then we left, and then uh, we got a little dirty down New Zealand, and got got our replacements in, and. This battalion was only in existence two years, and even though we had a strength of 900, 2,800 men went through the battalion in two years. And, uh, Jerry and I, and we went later up to New York, to, up to New Georgia, <coughs> New Georgia and uh, we were in the engage in the and yeah. uh, but anyway, it was just up north of the Guadalcanal. Canal. We were uh, up close to the end of the end of the and the path and the path of the road. And, uh, and so after those, there were, of the original 900, Jerry and I were in the, the 200 of the originals left. So we got to come back home. And uh, somehow, <coughs> Jerry and I, neither one of those, got a purple heart. Now the only thing I'd like to say is we have a there's one sitting right there. Uh, we worked nine years. We started in 1991 to write a book and people within the battalion, one colonel worked on it for a couple of years and another one for a couple of years. Finally, two years ago, we contracted with Joe Alexander, who I'm sure a lot of you have seen on the History Channel, if you've ever watched the History Channel. He is the chief historian of the History Channel for Lou Rita Productions. He's produced 18 documentaries on the History Channel, plus this is the fifth book that he wrote. And uh, I'm in the process of distributing. We had 3,000 copies issued. I've distributed so far about 1,150. But what I want to say is on Memorial Day night, Monday night, May 29th, 
on the History Channel at 9 p.m. Uh, Colonel Alexander is going to host a one-hour show. The first 30 minutes is going to be on Edson, General Edson, who was our commander. The Raiders are named after. And the second half of the show is on General Geiger, who commanded all the aircraft in the Solomon's campaign. Uh, and I think it'd be, if any of you ever watch his channel, I think it'd be well worthwhile to watch that show. How many Nine o'clock on Monday night. How many people get the History Channel at home? Good. Coming up. And in his presentation, he uses four people from our battalion uh, on that show. How many survivors are left today? We don't have any way of knowing. We estimate maybe three to four hundred. We have a reunion every April in Quantico, Virginia, and we get maybe... 50, 75, up and down, but we don't have any way of knowing how many. We, we lose 15 to 20 every year. Yeah, I was one of the kids. I was like 19. You were 19. How old were you, Jerry? I was 21. I was 22 during the... Uh, and I'm now a spray 80 years old, I'm glad to say. I'm still going strong. <laughs> now, Mr. Roselle mentioned that there are 24 ships named after the people of this battalion. Seven of our members became generals. Four got the Congressional Medal of Honor. Uh, our our uh, CEO and uh, Captain Bailey both got it on the Bloody Ridge, and the other two got it later on in the war. Many of our members during the war rose to, that we knew was captains, rose to colonel, lieutenant colonel. And uh, they said, well, what makes this battalion so special? And they said, well, it's training and leadership. And we had great leaders. And then I take it one step further and say, it was the leadership they developed in us that, uh, that, that led us go on. And when I came back overseas, people asked me, what's the difference between the Japanese fighting men and America? I said, well, the thing I found out was that we were taught to think for ourselves. And, it, and, and how many of you have watched D-Day, you know, on, on the YouTube channel, D-Day programs? And there were time after time after time there that uh, junior officers, lieutenants, captains, even then, then uh, enlisted men, made major decisions, major decisions. And yet there was a German general sitting there. He knew what he had to do, but he couldn't do it because he didn't get orders from above. And that was the main difference between you know, like all these guys were just to them, to individuals. We, we could see, think for ourselves. And, and, uh, not wasn't many times, but we saw once when an officer got rooted in the rear and then uh, and an on-com took over. And they lost the whole whole platoon in a, in a swamp up in New Georgia, and that the, uh, the non-com brought it through. So. Well, the only other thing I'd say, if any of, if any of you, you want to buy this book, say, for your grandfather, uh, see me afterwards, and I'll, uh, I'll tell you, it has a price tag on the cover of $32, but we're selling it for $19.95. And, you know, see me after, afterwards, and I'll tell you. Well, I'll tell you how you can buy it. Turn it over to somebody else. Okay. Well, we're going to pause here for a minute. Um, no, you guys didn't get much of a chance to ask any questions. We do have three minutes left. Oh, okay. Does anybody have a question for uh, our Edison Ranger, Mr. Edison, Mr. West? Yeah. Um, you guys weren't pilots, right? But, um, like, as the war went on and, um, like, better planes came out, did you feel like the ground fighting? Are you here? Sort of. Uh, for the Marines, for the United States Marines, this question is, uh, is the, we were talking about the bomb, and the, the uh, B-24s and the B-29s for fortress, and the technology improved for the Americans in the, in the aircraft. Did it get any easier for you guys on the ground? Well, not, <laughs> not really, really, because, because all you had, these guys were probably yeah, yeah. yeah, close air support came in through the Navy and through the Marine Corps. They're specialists, and that's, they're known for it. They 
carried it on up into Korea, and it was asked for it by the British and different ones. If they needed air support, they wanted the first Marine Air Wing to give it to them. Talking about weapons, we went through the Guadalcanal campaign with the World War One, Bolt Three, single bolt operator. One of our officers, the Seventh Marine, brought the M1, which was a semi. We we went through most of the bolt action. Well, I'm going to pause it right here for Dean Lawler, Walt Hammer, and James Butterfield, because they represent a generation that is quickly and rapidly disappearing from our midst. And uh, the things that these gentlemen had to go through when they were only a year or two older than you were, you are right now, the things that they wish you will never ever have to experience, and I think that's why they came in today. Um, last period we heard from Mr. Addison, and we heard from uh, Mr. West. They were at the Battle of Guadalcanal. They told us a little bit about <coughs> Edson's Rangers, all these men were U.S. Marines, but this is a special battalion of uh, Raider Marines. They had endured some really tough training. I think now we're going to hear from uh, some gentlemen who are at Peleliu. Uh, I have Dan Lawler was there, right? And James Butterfield was there. You want to go up to bed, Dan? Well, I'll try to. That's better. Can you hear me back there? Yeah, they can. Okay. Can you guys hear? Okay. On, on September the, the fourth, September the fourteenth, nineteen forty-four, we hit the island of Peleliu. Peleliu was four miles long and two miles wide. Uh, as your teacher told you, there was about ten thousand Japanese in there. I went in with the first assault wave, and I was in the machine guns. As you see, there's machine guns are up here. Uh, uh, the temperature. We were two, de two degrees off the equator. The temperature going in ran anywhere from 100 to 102 at night and probably 125 to 30 during the daytime. We went in with two canteens of water and at, three, and at uh, noon we had no water. They brought some water into us and it was all full of oil and we had a hard time drinking. Uh, the second day, the second day I, we went across the airfield and uh, I got hit with a shrapnel my back and it broke three fingers. So they took me out there. And uh, Jimmy Flutterfield was still with us. And he, uh, you want to take up for the Jim? Okay. I served with the first regiment where Danny served with the fifth. And the object of going into Pelu was to secure the airport and to draw troops from the Philippines because MacArthur was getting ready to go into, the, into there. I served with Chesty Puller. He was a colonel then. And we, our object, like I say, was to take the airport. Three days after we were on the island, we were declared unfit for battle because we did not have enough people. That's how bad we got shot out. So a lot of us were shipped into other regiments. And as you said before, they did shell it three days before. And you wondered how these guys lived there. <coughs> But they, it took us 24 hours to get off the beach. Uh, and it was one of the biggest battles we had was that Bloody Nose Ridge. And out of three companies, only 13 of us walked off there. How many men in the company? Uh, I think it was 250. Right. In that area, am I right? Yeah. You're right, Walton. Yeah. Yeah. So out of three companies, there's 13 men left? Uh-huh. Well, they were able to walk. They didn't all get killed. They were wounded. Uh, like Dady mentioned earlier, the heat got an awful lot of people. I heard you mention uh, a little over 1,000 casualties. I thought that we had about 7,000, didn't we, Dan? Huh? Let me look. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> it, it beat the division up pretty good. Go ahead, Jim. Big pardon? Keep going. Okay. So as I say, it, it, it was a tight battle and we did secure the airport and troops did come in from the Philippines, which made it a little easier for General MacArthur to get into there. Uh, it, it, it amazes you how these guys lived in these holes that they dug, you know? 
So if there's any questions, I'll take them. Talk about the Japanese, you mean? Yeah. Living underground. All right. When I first got to look at the Imperial Marines, of course, I'm not a big guy. And these guys come at you. And uh, I said, uh oh. But they give us a good fight. Well, the casualties on uh, the casualties we had. 1,252 killed, okay. 5,275 wounded. All right. Uh, yeah, I thought we were up at the 7,000. Uh, yeah. What was it? There was a 10,000, 10 to 12,000 Japs were killed. Right. Yeah, we were almost wiped out. There, I was in George Company, Second Battalion, and uh, we were almost gone. They don't. They did a good job on us after the first three days. But uh, as I say, we joined up with other people, and the, the day Danny got it the second day, but I was fortunate to, to go all the way through Peleliu. And after we got off Peleliu, we went back to uh, an island called Pavu to regroup, because they were bringing new people in from the States to build the division back up again. And that's when they, uh, Walter and, and Art were getting ready for Iwo Jima, and we were headed, Danny and I were headed up to Okinawa then, which was on uh, Easter Sunday, April Fool's Day. I, I thought that was quite quaint, but I want to talk about Oki, Dan? Uh, let's go back to Peleliu a little bit. Okay. Uh, right. John Murray was Hudson Falls here, he just died a year ago, and uh, he was on Peleliu and he had his kneecap load off. Harold uh, uh, Chapman was from Gansvert. Uh, he got killed on uh, uh, Okinawa, and Jimmy got hit, and uh, the four of us left Guns Falls together. And I ended up in Peking, China, like, like, afterwards. Because after I get I went back into Okinawa. What was your job, Dan? Machine gunner. Uh, you were a machine gunner. And these are pulses that you brought in? These are pulses I brought in, yes. Well, what are we looking at here exactly? <laughs> well, uh, uh, as you, you were talking about some of the old, Bob was talking about some of the old equipment, you know, that we were using. You notice up there, these guns are 1917, these are World War I guns. But we hadn't caught up to them at, at that particular time, so we used These were very good guns. You could throw these in the mud and they'd always work. Hmm. Uh, there's another thing that you asked about, uh, a change of uh, uh, news things coming in. On Okinawa, at the end of Okinawa, sitting there and this plane went by and made an awful lot of noise. And I said to the guy, what's that? He said, well, that's a new plane. He says, the, water, the, the air goes through and comes out the other side. He said, well, boy, this guy is gone. And that was the first time we, had, we all saw, we saw the uh, jets. There are, there are, uh, planes. What was your job, James? I was a rifle. I had a fire group. I was their leader. So, as I say, the four of us, Danny said, you mentioned before, with Chappie and, uh, and Jack, the four of us went overseas together. but. Then Danny and, and Jack went to the 5th Regiment, and Chappie and I stayed with the 1st Regiment. <coughs> so I, us two, we saw a lot of each other. Chappie got killed on May the 5th, and I got hit on May the 19th. At Peleliu? No, Okinawa. Okinawa? Yeah. Today's the 19th of May. Yeah. It's the anniversary of <laughs> your war. Yeah. Well, well, I, got, I, got it, I got it twice. They weren't satisfied the first time. So I got rifle fire the first time, and the second time I got it from mortar shells. Uh, the same day? No. Same day. Yeah. <laughs> that ended my career in the Corps. <laughs> uh, the Americans that were killed on Okinawa is uh, 12,250. There was 36,361 wounded. Now we're talking about we had a whole army in there plus uh, uh, three divisions of Marines. Uh, uh, when the people got on Okinawa, the people were on Okinawa and the Japs were on Okinawa, and by the time we got on, the island was 36 miles long, about four miles wide, and there was over a million people on it. Uh, we killed, uh, Once again, at Okinawa, our, our, our duty was to take, take and secure that airport. <laughs> Wherever we went, that was our first duty. Take it, secure it, and hold it. To, to put a little humor in this, uh, after it was over with, uh, where was this at? At Okinawa. Oh, okay. They had these uh, the girls that were left over. That were the Okinawan girls were doing our washing, and every time I walked by the, the washing 
thing. They say, Kichi guy, and they'd all laugh. And I said, what the hell are you calling me Kichi guy for? So it took a long time, and what they were talking about is because my hair was curly at that time, and they never saw curly hair. <laughs> I'm lucky I got here right. There are a lot of civilians who live down Okinawa, correct? Yes, yes. That, that was a new problem for us too, which we didn't have before. Uh, is, uh, some of our job was to round up the civilians. We finally had to put in stockades because they were dropping too many grenades in our laps. So, what do you mean by that? They come over and talk to you and drop a grenade in your lap. You know, they want to come over and bum a cigarette. And their job was to get rid of us. And this is after most of the battles that was over or during the battle? No, no, this was right during the battle. Yeah. You know, you didn't fight every day. Constantly fight every day, you're on the move a lot. And as it, you know, we never ran into villages. In fact, we ran into uh, fresh meat, we, which we hadn't seen in a long time. Up to Okinawa, they had cows, chickens, pigs. And nice gardens, it's a beautiful island. Actually, Okinawa is a beautiful island. A lot of farms. But the our orders were that if we took anything, we were issued invasion money. And we had, we were supposed to pay these people if we took a chicken. Some of those chickens you could put a 45 through and make that by going. But, <laughs> but uh, it, it was pretty nice up there. It was, it was hard with the people because you didn't know what you know. Patrols would go out into the villages and stuff, and they get ambushed by their by the Japanese people, the, the people that were living there. You think they were friendly? So then they, that, that's when they ordered them up take them out, put them in stockades. So that wasted a lot of our time and slowed us up too. Uh, uh, Mr. Ozell, you're asked about the casualties. Now, much to our sorrow, we killed 150,000 uh, Okinawans on the island. Which, these are civilians? These are civilians, right. How, most of that from bombing? Or? It, well, it was, no, they were in the cage, they were locked up in the cage, and uh, they were feeding the Japs, we call them Japs because uh, shells and stuff, so we could, you know, we were getting too many, too many casualties. So we, we took as many as we could. We got out as many as we could, but there's a lot of them that didn't get out. But that's where our casualties was on working on people. Yeah. Oh yes. Well, a lot of, a lot of. Oh, another thing too. The Japanese carried a knife, oh, well, three or four inches long. They call it the Harry Carey knives, and uh, they believed in buying, dying for the emperor. So what they would do, a lot of, they just take their own life. You take the Harry Carey, especially on Okinawa. Uh, we drove them out to the water, and they all jumped off the cliffs. They jumped off the cliffs, and we used to very carry one of the other lava. The other took everything with them. The further across your body you could bring that knife before you drop, the, the better man you were. Is there a... We're talking about Japanese soldiers, not civilians, with the hairy carry? Or? They're soldiers, they're soldiers, yes. Uh, if they've got time, anybody, I've got some Japanese pictures of, of the soldiers here in my scrapbook up on the wall. Uh, it's back there, it's open door now. Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll just up there. Yeah, we'll, we'll look at the artifacts uh, towards the end here, I think. Okay, uh, what it, about the kids? I had a question. I well, read your narrative about the little kids who would come up to you. And oh, yes, well, I had, I can tell you, the kids would tear your heart out, really. Uh, I had two, a little boy and a little girl come out. They were about two or three years old. And uh, they were scared, they were shaken, uh, there, there, there were no shoes, uh, they were covered with blood, they just came out of these caves. We were trying to get them out of the caves, and I remember the words were, Day, day, koi, shimpai, shanai, day. And then come out, we'll give you food and water. And we couldn't get them to come out. Well, these two kids come out, and uh, they stood in front of me, and uh, they were hungry. They put their hands out, and they wouldn't even take food from us. They hadn't eaten, I don't know how long. So I finally got, sat down with them. I put the rifle down, but it wasn't a rifle, it was a pistol, and they came out, and I finally got them to eat some candy, and that's how we started with the kids. And the kids really brought the grown-ups out after that, because the grown-ups wouldn't come out at all at first. These are the civilians. These are civilians <coughs> in the caves. Yes. Who were afraid, basically. But, well, they told, they told, another thing too, they told the Japanese, uh, they told the Japanese soldiers that uh, American Marines had to kill your mother or father in a square of where you lived. In other words, Hudson Falls, or we would have to take down either kill one of them or both of them down in the square for everybody to watch. So they were scared, scared death of us. They didn't know, that's why they didn't, uh, that's why they 
by the soldier didn't surrender. That's what the soldiers told us. Right? They told, well, the soldiers told the, the uh, head of the soldiers told the soldiers that they wouldn't. And so of course the civilians found that out too, and so they were scared of us too. We had uh, 98 days on Okinawa. Uh, went for there, I went to Peking, China. I don't want to get into that, but that's very nice. of a written city and, and stuff like that. Has he got any questions? Yeah, do we have any questions? We have about, <clears throat> we'll go for another five minutes with some questions, if you guys have them. I'm going to wait on you because we're going to have a class change in about five minutes. Uh, if you got a question in the back, Mr. Winyo, I'll relay it here. How did you guys feel about uh, the United States returning Okinawa to Japan? How did you feel about the U.S. returning Okinawa to Japan? Well, when was that? When did that happen? In the 60s? Recently, we're saying. Of course, the, 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 don't forget the Japanese owned uh, Okinawa. The people in Okinawa, uh, they years prior to this, they took the, the male inhabitants off and put Okinawans on. So consequently, these were most most of them were Japanese. But don't ever call one of them a Jap. He, he, they hated them worse than we did. The Okinawan yes, people did. yes, didn't like the Japanese they, because they treated them worse than they could treat us. They, they took everything away from them. They took the food away from them. And, 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 uh, and in fact, I, a lot of them Okinawans killed a lot of the Japanese soldiers too. Well, the Japanese everywhere in Southeast Asia, China treated the people. Like slaves, the Korean oh, yeah, Korea. Yeah. yeah, but uh, another thing to stick in here, what I think about on Okinawa or on Guadalcanal, that was the first time a Japanese ever lost a battle in 200 and some odd years. The Guadalcanal, which is the turning point in the Pacific for the land then. war. Yeah, see, and they were in China. They were all over. Well, to answer the person's question, I was definitely not happy when they gave Okinawa back, but uh, we needed that base there and now you know they're they're treating us as though we did something wrong because we beat them that's that's the thing sir. and they still do i go to hawaii quite often and uh uh the arizona i visit and they uh they'll push you around if they can still Okay, Andrew's got a question. Um, this is from Mr. Butterfield. Um, you said that you lost your sight by a shrapnel. What, what was it, like a bouncing battery or what happened? Can you hear Joe? Would you repeat that? Uh, you no, lost your sight by a shrapnel. Was it a bouncing battery or what? what uh, no, mortar shell. Oh, no, okay. Mortars. The, the, the first they got, well, the friend of mine got hit and I went out to get him. And I got him, and I got him back in, but I didn't look in the right direction, and then I got it. And then uh, I was headed back to the aid station, and they dropped in one of the biggest mortar barrages we had while we were over there. And that's when I got it again. And my uncle always told me to get hit in the head, it wouldn't kill me. <laughs> <laughs> you know what he was talking about. <laughs> I think Irishman, that's all. <laughs> Who's got another question? Anybody? Uh, Andrew, other Andrew. Uh, how did you feel about the, the Japanese soldiers when you were in combat with them? How did you feel about the Japanese soldiers when you were in combat with them? <coughs> Say it again. How did you feel about the Japanese soldier as an enemy when they, you were in combat with them? They were definitely an enemy. How did I feel about them then? Well, my object was to kill as many as I could. You got have time to think. You've got to remember, either you, you didn't worry about it, you had a job to do and you did it. To kill or be killed, that's what the answer was. And uh, as far as Japanese... My, my, my problem was that I didn't kill the right one. <laughs> <laughs> I was in Hawaii and this waiter comes up to me and he says, Excuse me, Mr. Butterfield, can I ask you a personal question? And I says, Sure. He says, did you get the one that got you? I says, no, that's why I'm in Hawaii. I think he owns a hotel here. <laughs> Still looking for him. We got time for another question? Uh, go ahead, Lou. When you would get wounded, what, what would you think? Did you think it was over? You were dead? Or? What were you thinking, Jim, when uh, you were wounded? Did you think it was over? Did you think you were dead? Was it the end? Uh, 
that at first I didn't uh, I didn't know what hit me at first. I think I was more surprised than anything else. And then uh, it might have been uh, two weeks later, three weeks later, before I started coming around pretty good. I was when I woke up when I was in Guam, and uh, you know I I didn't figure that I lost my sight. Uh, this doesn't happen to you. And then maybe six weeks to two months later when I was in the hospital in uh, Aia Heights in uh, Honolulu, uh, the doctor came in one morning and he says, uh, are you getting used to the idea? And I said, what idea? He says that you can't see. I says, who said I can't see? <laughs> he said, didn't they tell you that in Guam? I says, no, they didn't tell me. So I, I got quite upset. In fact, I got very mad about the whole thing, which I think was a good thing as far as I was went, because I didn't, uh, I was more mad at everything than uh, at people and feeling sorry for myself, which I have never done. It was, it was part of the territory, I guess. I was 14 months in the hospital having the face rebuilt. That's why I look younger today. <laughs> But it's, it's not as bad as people make it out to be. Yes, ma'am. Oh, yes. Uh, I don't know how many people know Dr. Barber was a surgeon here at the Glens Falls Hospital for many years. And when I was at IE Heights, uh, he was stationed in Honolulu, which I didn't know that at the time. But he was walking into the ward one day and asking for Jim Butterfield. And he comes up and he said, Dick Barber, which I knew Dick before. Well, I left town here, and uh, he says, let me take a look at you. I says, Dick, I said, you're in the Army. I said, I don't think they, this is a Navy hospital. I don't think they want you to take those bandages off. He says, I want to see what they're doing to you. So he was the first one I see from home. So I had a lot of support in my, with my problem. My biggest problem was telling my mother that was hard. But otherwise, it would, my life has been very good. And a very happy one. I have a nice wife, nice daughter, and four spoiled grandchildren. <laughs> Who spoiled them? <laughs> Good wife. <laughs> well, we have about uh, a minute left, and I just want to conclude this portion. We're going to continue the next period and hear from gentlemen who are at Iwo Jima. Um, I just like to conclude this portion uh, by having you guys think about uh, what the American flag means to these gentlemen. Memorial Day Parade, uh, when you see it go by, uh, stop and pause for a minute because that's what, that's the most important holiday as far as these gentlemen are concerned, and it's to remember their friends who are no longer with them, who either didn't come back or who did come back and have passed away after serving their country. So uh, let's give them a round of applause, okay? If you want, you can I'd like to read a letter. <clears throat> this letter is going to take me about 10 minutes to read. And then I'll turn it over to Art Laporte and Walt Hammer, who were at the Battle of Iwo Jima. Uh, this letter was written by a gentleman named John Murray. It was written to his son. It came into my hands about two days ago. I read it last night for the first time. I thought it would be uh, pretty appropriate to share with you. It's a letter from a father to his son, 55, excuse me, 51 years after the events that took place. Uh, Mr. Murray was a Hudson Falls native who was at the <coughs> Battle of Peleliu. And I believe he passed away in April 1988. When? Uh, yeah. Okinawa and no, two years ago. He was on Okinawa and <coughs> Peleliu, so that would have been two Aprils ago he passed away. <coughs> this is a letter he wrote to his son. Have you guys seen a copy of this letter? Okay. <coughs> To my son George, you stirred my emotions the evening you phoned me to let me know that there was a special on TV con concerning the invasion of Peleliu. Needless to say, I felt a son's pride for his dad because of something that happened 51 years ago. September 15, 1944, the 1st Marine Division invaded the island of Peleliu, and I was wounded on October 6, 1944. Hopefully I can reconstruct some of what happened during this period. I was 17 years old when I enlisted in the Corps. 
when this mission occurred, I was 19 years old. One of the first things was that we were Marines the best and we should be proud of being a Marine. We were taught about pride in ourselves, pride in the Marine Corps and our country. In boot camp, Paris Island, South Carolina, pride was stressed every waking hour, 20 hours a day. The standards were far above anything I could imagine. Seven days a week for 13 weeks. Those who couldn't make it were made cooks. That's probably why the food was so bad. After boot camp, we were sent to New Riva, North Carolina for further training. I was wrong. I thought nothing could surpass Paris Island training. At New Riva, I was introduced to 30 mile force marches, beach landings at night, swamps, bugs, snakes, and the continuance of pride and discipline in training. Most of the instructors were career Marines with unbelievable standards from appearance, uniforms, equipment, bunks, bedding, even foot lockers. There were no excuses from you, total responsibility. All was done for a reason, but it took time to understand these qualities. After many weeks in New Riva, North Carolina, we were, ship, we were sent by ship to New Caledonia in the South Pacific for further training and assignment. Overseas training was more rigid than stateside. The first Marine Raiders had trained in New Caledonia. The obstacle course was running uphill. What an experience. This was with full gear. Training in infested swamps, living in slit trenches, again 30 mile force marches. Staying in the field a week at a time, no bunks, no hot food. We had lots of filth and grime on our bodies and clothing, but at 5 a.m. the following day at roll call, you'd better be clean all over, especially clean shaven. Clean gear, especially your weapon. I and many others were assigned to the 1st Marine Division, 5th Marines of Regiment, 2nd Battalion, 6th Company. <clears throat> I was assigned to a light machine gun. My training on the new weapon started all over again. There's a poster on the back wall here. Not the weapon, I believe. My training to this point was on an M1 rifle and bayonet training. I, was in, I went in as a replacement on Cape Blouser for a very short stay. All there was was mud and lots of rain. Remember, they're in the South Pacific. Everything and everybody got stuck. We all felt, who needs this? Who wants it? Very little resistance. I always believed the Japs didn't want it either. We left Cape Gloucester sometime in April 1944 for an island called Pavuzi in the Russell Islands. This is part of the Solomon chain. This is supposed to be a rest camp, all mud and coconut plantations. The CBs, Naval Construction Battalions, did the setting up of camp and did the roads. And what did we do? We started training again. We ran our asses off through coconut groves in full gear day and night. I thought I was in hell. We trained so hard for combat. It's hard to describe. No one other than another Marine would believe you. All of our training was getting us ready for an invasion. As the days passed, our unit became one in total harmony. A unit such as I've never seen before. We all became very close, sharing what all we had. As I look back at it now, I remember very few names, but I do remember faces. I could fill the pad with my experience on Pavuzi. Men seemed to have lots of laughs and other times sadness. Sadness came from letters from home. There were nights when we would hear a shot ring out. The following morning, we would be told that so-and-so got a Dear John letter. Raise your hand if you know what a Dear John letter is. It's a letter from a girlfriend back home saying she's no longer interested in being your girlfriend. Sometime around the end of July, a strange and subtle change came from over Pavuzi. We knew something was wrong. Our company became very close. We helped each other in any way we could. I started taking better care of my machine gun, looking at it with greater respect. We all began to step a little livelier as we did our respective tasks. Discipline became a dye that stained the smallest thread of a man's life in the 1st Marine Division. We looked at our officers with new security. There was less complaining. More respect was surfacing for each other and especially our leaders. Letters from home stopped and letters to home stopped. We knew we would be leaving Pavuzi soon. We started an intense training of landings. We also saw new equipment being unloaded on the pier. We started hearing about Peleliu. We left Pavuzi September 4th, 1944. D-Day was September 15th, 1944. <coughs> this slide uh, was done by a painter who was at Peleliu, jungle fighting. D-Day was September 15, 1944. There were 17 transports loaded with Marines and their support functions. We stopped at Guadalcanal and Cape Capernance for landing rehearsal. 
We were told we would have casualties, but the invasion would be short but fast, three days, maybe only two. Being on ships in the South Pacific was extremely hot. One morning I went topside and I couldn't believe. As far as the eye could see in all directions was the 7th Fleet. They had met us during the night. Battle wagons, aircraft carriers, destroyers, plus others. It was an awesome sight, but also very frightening. September 15th was a very calm morning. We were 1,500 miles north of Pavuzi in the Central Pacific. We got in into Antrax, no barges for our battalion. We had to go over coral rocks and reefs and it was quite bumpy. No one said much. We could see the island now. The Navy had pounded it for days and we're still pounding the hell out of it. We circled for about an hour and then all at once landing craft headed toward the shore through clouds of smoke. What a horrible feeling. We had three regiments, the first, fifth, me, and the seventh. We landed abreast, and the fifth was in the middle, and we were to advance directly to the airfield and cross it. We got hit hard here. The Marines were dropping all around us. Movement was slow. I was in the second wave. It was terrifying. The Marines they treated so long we were dead or dying or wounded. The first wave took an awful pounding. The Japs had awesome firepower set up in the pillboxes, in tunnels, on ridges, and we had to crawl. I can never explain my feelings and fear at this point. It was something one has to experience. I now know why we trained so hard and the discipline we, we were taught started to pay off. We moved to the edge of the airfield. At this point I counted my casualties. We had lost two ammunition carriers, two out of five. We kept moving onto the airship and we were told to dig in for the night. We had to move in over a hundred yards at the most. It was all coral rock and difficult to dig. Most of us used our picks. We were lucky we had dug in. The Japs threw a counterattack at us using three small but fast tanks followed by troops. We repelled them with the help of our tank people who had just landed. Five Shermans got between them and us. We totally destroyed them. Our own firepower was awesome. My training paid off at this point. I burned out two barrels and was able to change them within 30 seconds. Our firepower was now superior to theirs, especially with the tanks being on the island. Also, our planes were now airborne, doing their job of strafing and dropping napalm bombs. Our first night was horrible. Japs were yelling. They were also playing Tokyo Rose records. Constant strafing from them and everything was so black. No sleep. We didn't dare close our eyes. We also found out that the first day we had lost 1,500 Marines on the morning, in the morning on the beach. We also lost two out of our squad of 15 men. After 51 years, George, I remember faces but few names. The following morning, September 16th, we had to cross the airfield in the open following our tanks. We knew we would take casualties, but again, our training and discipline would pay off. As we moved on to the airfield, the Japs started shooting at us. Again, some of my buddies were going down. Fortunately, our speed and conditioning paid off again, and it was at its best. This 18-year-old's ego had gone. All he could handle was the close combat. Lucky, luckily, we made it to the far side of the airfield. My squad was still intact. The first thing I saw was a Japanese machine gunner chained to his gun. To me, this is unbelievable. The bastards were inhuman and they were not going to give up. My memory of what happened was total destruction and death. Every day was the same. That damn island was all coral rock. Our movement was slow, sometimes only a few yards each day. There's so much that happened between September 15th and October 6th when I got wounded. It's hazy now because it was 51 years ago. All was very vivid for so long. Sleepless nights that were so long, filled with emptiness, sadness, fear, and total anger. We soon realized the Japs were not going to quit. They were going to fight until last. The nights were the worst. Their constant yelling, flares in the sky all the time, spurts from our machine guns. I know I prayed a lot. I had my rosary around my neck. It all helped. We all prayed and remembered our relentless training and hoped the two pulling together would help us through. As the days went on, I realized that there was a strong possibility I wouldn't get off Peleliu alive. Some of our men were getting hit and we were much smaller now. Also, there was no water on the island, and our water was brought in old oil drums that hadn't been cleaned properly. Between the bad water and extreme heat, many of us started to get sick with dysentery and fungus. I believe time on the island under these conditions was starting to take its toll. The 1st and 7th Marines were out of action because of casualties. We, the 5th Marines, had to take Bloody Nose Ridge. We lost many of our men the first day on the beach and going across the airfield, and others up to this time of October 5th. We started up the ridge October 6th. As we pressed toward the top, flamethrowers were necessary to get those animals out of the caves. The closer we got to the top, the more resistance took place. Our second lieutenant 
Pat Corrigan from Chicago tried to go over the top and got hit in the shoulder and had to be moved down. Machine gunners were spread across the ridges and front lines and were given orders to spray the ridges. I realized our squad had been hit hard. There were 15 of us on September 15th and now on October 6th there were five of us left and most of us were sick. I know I was. We sprayed the ridges and especially the caves where the bastards hid. The order was given to stop firing. I turned around and asked for more ammunition. I only had five more rounds left. I hadn't realized my knee was exposed. Something made me left ear ring. I looked down and saw that my right knee had been shot off by a sniper hidden in a cave. I lay flat and had just enough cover so he couldn't get a good shot at me. They located the, the cave <clears throat> and a flamethrower came up and filled the cave with flames. That jack came running out, flames all over him, completely engulfed. I fired a burst at him and it was all over then. Our people secured the island October 25th, but my part in it was over October 6th on an island that was predicted to take three days at most to secure. What a tragedy and loss of men. And the worst of it was that we were finally told after 50 years that this invasion was not necessary. MacArthur had invaded the Philippines before Peleliu was even secured. As you know, I had five operations when I was in the service, four more in recent years. It's been quite a journey, George. High school and sports. Marine Corps, war and wounds. After marriage, children, and then my 39th career with General Electric. Then came the loss of your mother, then my heart attack, open heart surgery and other surgeries. Happily now I have Joan, my caring Joan, to take care of me. Yes, my son, it's been quite a journey. I'm very proud of being part of everything that has happened. Some things had to change, had to be changed for my own good and for my family's. I hope I always did the best I could to take that time with what I had to do with. Sometimes they're bitter, but most times they're good and full of happiness. And though I haven't talked about my Marine Corps career, the fact is that the Marine Corps is deeply rooted within me. I'm very proud to have been a member of the Marine Corps, especially the 1st Marine Division. <coughs> Being a Marine is so special. I think these gentlemen would agree. The real meaning of discipline was taught to me. This brought out the honesty, loyalty, pride, and respect which I believe helped me so much through life. It really is a wonderful world, full of everything imaginable. We have so many choices of which direction we would like to go. Hopefully, we choose the proper direction for ourselves. Thanks again, my son, for asking for this letter to you from your father. God bless. Dad. And this is by Corporal John Murray, U.S. Marine Corps, and it's dated December 8, 1995. And, uh, our high school secretary, Mrs. Murray, this was her father. -in -law. And she gave me this letter <clears throat> because she knew Dan Lawler was going to be here today. Dan was good friends with John and, uh, and Jimmy. We brought the very team. We brought the very team for Jack. We run the very team for Jack when he was interred. He passed away two years ago, or two Aprils ago, right? Right. Right after uh, Easter. I think Jack said it all. You did a very good job. I've never heard this before. I didn't think you had. I just read it last night for the first time myself, and I thought it would be appropriate. Um, so, Powell Lewis, 1944. Um, and then came Iwo Jima. And I think Art and uh, Walt are going to have some things to say about Iwo Jima. Do we have a map of it? Yeah, I'm going to put it up right now. You want a big overview map or you want that map? Just, just so you can point things out on it. Okay. <coughs> I might just mention that Iwo Jima was eight square miles, that's it. And it had to be had. And, uh... Well, no, why don't you take this one? I can hold this right in your hand. This map here shows Iwo Jima as a pork chop. With Mount Suribachi at this corner right here. This 
is a <coughs> yeah. this is Sirabachi. This is after four or five days the flag went up. Uh, there's two landing beaches, but this was the main landing beach right over here. And the center was where I landed was on yellow one. And then we also had the 25th Regiment on the, the right hand side. And uh, the 5th Marine Division was from here on down. 24th was in reserve. And when we landed on D Day, the 25th, 28th Regiment of the 5th Division cut right across. We landed here, and the airfield was here. There was another one coming in here and they were starting one up in here. The main reason they wanted to get Iwo Jima was not only to get the air bases for their bombers, but for a place for those bombers to come back and crash, because there were 10 men on each bomber. And by those bombers being able to land there, they also had P-51 escorts to take them over to Japan, which was given protection that way. And I understand that over 25,000 Air Force men landed on Iwo Jima. Uh, this uh, volcanic ash was like the Sahara Desert. If you built, dug yourself a foxhole, you dug yourself a tub. And it was wide enough that you had to get deep enough in it. It wasn't a foxhole in the true sense. And uh, they had cisterns all over the island and they got destroyed by the Navy. The water ran out and a lot of those systems became operating rooms for the doctors. Doctors took those over. And the Japanese themselves, as this wore on, this campaign, they started wanting for water. And they used to go out and take from the dead Marines their canteen, or they took cans that would have been ripped open with food in it. And then they set them outside when it did rain to collect their water. Now, I understand from reading an article of the Japanese person, soldier, that he said he lived a miserable life underground because he said they had to get the water so they could take, take their biscuits and soak them so they could eat them. And the lice drove them crazy. That's one thing I'm very happy about. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> the more lice, the better. But. Uh, they, they were the type of people, so they're bringing up that they stayed in the ground and they died in the ground. And if you took the battleship Missouri and sliced it in half, that would give you an idea how they had been built and how they lived under there. They just, everything was covered over. You take that battleship, cover it over, and that was it. And they lived that way and they fought that way and they fought to the very end. I saw six prisoners. And I was a little mad at them because they were having spaghetti when I was having K rations. But the combat, uh, <coughs> the combat police would not let you get near them. Art, sorry about that. Um, you have anything to add, Art? Yes. Um, I'd like to give you a little description. Uh, not having been in combat before, Walt and I, that was our first combat, uh, we were very nervous, so we didn't try, we couldn't sleep the night before we were to land on Iwo, so we played poker all night. Uh, early in the morning, well, during the night, we were getting close to Iwo, we heard a lot of heavy gunfire, so we went up on the deck, and uh, all we could see, we couldn't actually see Iwo because of the darkness, we saw the explosions of the 16-inch uh, shells. Now, the 16-inch shell is about, like, cross my body wide, 2,000 pounds, and you can imagine uh, what explosive that is. In fact, if you were quite a distance when one of those shells landed, it would raise you right off the deck. Did that many a time on Evil when I was there at night, and boy, did I ever cuss the Navy or interrupt my sleep if I got any. Anyways, early in the morning, they fed us a steak dinner, then we went up on deck and we watched the going on over Iwo. The uh, first outfit to go in was 9 o'clock uh, to hit the beaches. And we weren't scheduled to go into the afternoon, but they lost so many men that we went in at 11 o'clock. Uh, the the uh, thing that really got to us 
almost immediately the uh, the boats were bringing back the wounded to our ship. Uh, I guess they were at least uh, uh, not so badly hit casualties. Uh, the the worst ones were being taken to the uh, hospital ship, but they were bringing uh, casualties back to our ship, and of course that made us quite nervous because uh, we knew what was we were getting into. Then I uh, came our turn at 11 o'clock, 11 a.m. to uh, hit the beach. We were called in early. And uh, the Japs didn't fire on us as we went. I didn't hardly see any uh, shells. Uh, I was up in the machine gun nest in the landing craft because I was a machine gunner. That machine gun to the right was my weapon, my main weapon. It's called a light machine gun. Uh, great weapon. And uh, I never got the fire going in. Then we had to, when we hit the beach, we had to go up a slight rise, probably eight to ten feet high. And as Walt said, the, the stuff, the sand, you could hardly walk in it. It was shifting like. And we had an awful time getting up over there under, uh, and by this time the Japs were firing. The artillery was coming in. Uh, we ran up towards the, the airfield was right directly ahead of us, which the 4th Division was supposed to take. Uh, Mount Suribachi on the bottom there, if you see on the map, was being taken by the 5th Division. The 3rd Division, you'll see on that gentleman's hat over there, says Navy, is the 3rd Division. That was in reserve. We ran up uh, probably about 100 yards in, hit the deck, then the, uh, the deck started shelling us, and they were doing it in in waves. Uh, it hit up towards the airfield, then came towards us, and I thought, well, everything on the beach is going to get hit, but we lost very few men in that, uh, in that barrage. Uh, shortly after uh, I was on the uh, land there, I looked back, and what had been a clear beach was now uh, a lot of landing crafts were destroyed, tanks uh, were destroyed, uh, so they had really laid in. Bullets were flying in the air like bees. Uh, was I scared? Oh yes, I was scared. Uh, I'd never been taught to dig a foxhole in my feet, but I kept moving my foot back, got a depression, and back down into it. That was my first foxhole. The, uh, then we got the word to move towards the airfield, but then they pulled us back towards the beach. Then we had a sniper shooting at us from the rear, and uh, there was a ship back there, so we went back to the ship, you know, we hit the deck and run towards the ship and hit the deck. And uh, we, we busted our way in, uh, kicked the door open, and who's in there but a Navy landing party. And they had clothes hung up, they just washed, and uh, of course there was no sniper there. And we said to the guy, don't you know there's a war on? So then, uh, that was the first day. The second day, we, uh, it was our job to take the ridges to the right, so we moved up over the ridges uh, under heavy fire. Well, as we moved up uh, up to the, the top of the ridge, some of our tanks uh, were moving in, and uh, for tank war toward the tanks, there was just murder. Uh, there was three of them I saw them lined up, uh, firing, trying to help the men take the airfield. The mortars laid in on them, and one after another, they were knocked out. So Iwo was not a good place for the tanks. We went over the ridge. Uh, and fought our way uh, towards the what would be the top top there towards that direction of the island. Uh, I think if you go down about halfway, right about in that area over there to the right there, would be where we were located. Uh, we were there about two or three days. Then we lost so many men in the fighting. We lost half our company that they moved us back to the beach. Got a break. Of course, I knew there was no such thing as a break because uh, being so small, four by two, uh, any of the mortars or any of that artillery could hit us and they were throwing them in all the time. Uh, now, we're uh, just across from where your finger was is a hill called 382 Here. in that area. And uh, the unfinished airfield, they had number one airfield, number two airfield, and then they had the unfinished airfield that Walt was talking about they were working on. Well, we got the word, this was about 
February 1, we got the word that, hurry, we got the word that uh, one of our outfits up there had got the pounded pretty badly, so we were to replace them. So we went up during the night, early morning, and uh, moved into position. They, uh, they were starting to get light, so they asked us to, uh, told us to get in the foxholes. So I started to get into a foxhole, and uh, I looked down, and there was Marine sitting there. See his feet? I come up his body, and his rifle was standing beside him, <coughs> sitting beside him. So I said to him, uh, I'm going to get in with you, all right. And uh, no answer, and as I come up his body, no head. Some uh, officer, somebody had taken his head off during the night. So I felt the hair raising the back of my head, and I got away from there. Found another foxhole, jumped in it. Well, I guess they must have had a pretty tough battle because I've almost broke my legs getting in that one. It was dug so deep. Then the morning came, and uh, the first thing I had was a sniper was trying to get me. The bullets were going by my head, but he wasn't a very good shot, thank goodness. Shooting from Hell 382, which would be over there. Then we got the word to move out, so I went running up to catch up with my outfit, which was just a little bit ahead of me. Then a machine gun got after me, and um, I didn't hear it. Uh, all I knew, uh, the first thing I knew was that suddenly I was flying through the air. He had knocked my legs out from under me because he had hit my left leg. Well, lucky for me, there was what you'd call a five-inch shell hole, which was just a depression in the sand, and lucky for me, I landed in it, wasn't hit, or I wasn't hit anymore, I should say, because I was already badly hit. So I looked down at my, we wore leggings in them days, I don't know if they still wear them, but we wore them in them days, and my legging had been just blasted apart. There was a wound in the lower part of my, my leg muscle, that I could put my fist in, I could see the, the uh, actually see the bone, and um, so I knew I was badly hit, so I hollered out for help, you know, and uh, I heard running, and the machine gun was chattering again, and then the body landed on top of me, it was my sergeant, he says, how badly are you hit, and I says, look, well, above the big one was a graze across the muscle, which I'm glad didn't explode, it was an explosive bullet that got me, and uh, so he says, well, that's nothing. It's only a, uh, you know, a nothing. I said, well, look lower. And boy, he let out a, a, some, a profanity. Then next to me was a 60-inch, what you call a 60-inch shell hole. Now, this was made by one of those 60, uh, from the battle wagons. And you could put about 15, 20 people, I'd say, in there, wouldn't you, Don? So anyways, he got to that, then I heard running again, and another body plopped on me. This time it was a corpsman. Now when I say plop on me, you had to go real low, because that shell hole wasn't very deep. And the bullets, all the time, after he landed on me, the bullets were going over from that machine gun. The corpsman tried to work on me, but he couldn't, uh, it was just too shallow, he couldn't work. So he said to me, now from here to you, my friend, with the X on your hat there, he, they said to me, would you take a chance of us pushing you over to that 16-inch hole where he can work on you? I said, yes, I'll take the chance. Of course, I didn't want to die. So they pushed me across. All the time that machine gun was flashing away, the man that reached out for me never touched me that machine gun. He was a lousy shot. wasn't using tracers anyway. <coughs> the man that reached out for me got a graze across the arm. I saw him later on in the hospital. And he showed me the graze he got, reaching out to, to grab me in. They patched me up in the shell hole, and uh, then my outfit moved against Hill 382, which is in the middle there, with second highest uh, peak in uh, on Eagle, and one of the toughest ones they fought for. <coughs> I looked, I, I laid it, or sat there all day, tried to eat, couldn't eat. I throw it back up, couldn't drink. Uh, I noticed uh, I could hear the battle going uh, from my outfit trying to take Hill 382. I noticed a wet sensation. I saw oh, the, uh, the, the, the my wound is bleeding. I looked down. I couldn't see nothing. I raised my pants leg a little bit, or, and there was a neatest little fountain coming up out of my kneecap, a piece of strap that had gone in there. 
So I'm saying, well, I have no bandages. You only have one bandage. So I'm reaching my pocket and found some toilet tissue. So I put that on. Luckily, it stopped right away. Uh, the phone kind of lulled down a little bit, and I thought, well, I guess I men have taken Hill 382. Then all of a sudden it peaked up, the bullets were flying overhead, men were running by me, and the first thing I could think of, nobody had tried to come out and get me because there was just too many bullets. They weren't going to risk four men to rescue one. So I'm thinking, well, they're going to leave me out here and them gooks are going to get me. I'm sorry to say gooks, you shouldn't say that now, but they were gooks to us. <laughs> Anyways, uh, the sergeant come to had then with me in the morning, he looked down at me, he said, they didn't get you out of here yet. I said, no, they didn't dare to risk the men. And uh, he said, can you stand on that one good leg? I said, yes. So somehow he got me on his shoulder and he carried me out. And uh, then they boarded me on a landing craft out to the hospital ship, and here I am. Thank you. Our, our latest surgeon of Korea. And, uh, did, did you two all serve in Korea? No, no. I'd like to say a little more on Iwo if I could. We have uh, just two minutes. Anymore? Two minutes? Yeah. Uh, when we landed, our landing craft got hit, and I was a heavy machine gunner, carried a 43-pound receiver. We had a tripod carrier. We also had a guy that carried the barrel, which had a handle on it, a little pocket. But when we landed, I got ashore, and the landing craft backed back off again, and the barrel went with it. So when we got on shore, I said to Looney, we can't do damn nothing right now, so take that tripod and put it on the ground, and let me put my receiver on there. And the uh, first thing that had to be done around there is to start finding the mines, or you wouldn't have got any tanks, or any bulldozer tanks, or any flamethrower tanks in there. And so for a while, that's what we were doing. We were doing engineering work to make pass up there, putting the white tapes on the side so that we could get some heavy equipment up in there. And later on, about two days later, the barrel came. Um, we're going to conclude the program now. We're sorry we didn't have enough time for questions, but these gentlemen are going to stay for a little while afterwards. You're welcome to come up and see the artifacts. They have uh, captured Japanese flags or purple hearts, etc. And uh, hold it, wait a minute. Before you leave, I just want to remind you uh, what holiday is coming up. Tell me, what's the holiday? Okay, so we want to stop and pause. It's not just another three-day weekend. It's not just a big three-day party. You think about what it means, these gentlemen, please, and what they went through so that you have your freedom today. And uh, it's a day to remember their friends, their fallen comrades, like John Murray, who's not here today. Uh, let's come around and pause. Uh, Mr. Rosell, 10H, the kids are going to transcribe some of the